everyone, welcome to our fifth episode of JSID Insta Live. My name's Jessica, and I am super excited to be talking about today's topic, which is all about Japan, more specifically, traveling Japan. And to do that, I'm going to be bringing on our next wonderful guest speaker, Sally Miles from JNTO. Now, Sally is also a JET alumni and the Vice President of JET AA New South Wales. Before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that if you've missed any of our previous episodes, you can always go onto our Instagram profile and view them directly there. Or alternatively, you can hop onto our main website, go to the header information and culture, and then drop down to our JSID Insta Live and scroll through the archives there. Okay, so give me a few moments while I invite Sally on to come talk with us. If you've been following our account, you would have uh, seen a post that we did earlier. Uh, she shared some of her, whoops, sorry, this is me being, uh, shared some of her wonderful travel adventures with us. Hello, Sally, how are you? Hey, Jess, I'm great. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Can you hear me okay? I can indeed. And all right for audio on my side? I am actually going to try and turn you up a bit. Sorry, everybody, for my hand being in the way. <laughs> Is that any better? Okay, that's perfect. Beautiful. I put my phone further away from me today, so. Fair enough. <laughs> but yeah, so I love your background. Thank you, I'm in the office today. You're in the office today? Um, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Or I'm in my makeshift office at home, I should say. I know that story. Yeah. I think a lot of us do at this point, but... Yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> so you're in the office. You work for JNTO. Can you tell me a little bit more about what JNTO does? Yeah, I'd love to. Thanks. So um, JNTO stands for Japan National Tourism Organization. So we are the tourism board that promotes travel to Japan. And our office located in Sydney looks after Australia and New Zealand. So um, when you see ads that are promoting Japan, sometimes they'll be done by our partners and we're not involved. And we love to see that because we love seeing anyone promote Japan. But sometimes you'll see ones that are from us. So if you ever see the JNTO logo or the Japan and List Discovery logo with the little um, red sun and the sakura on it, that's JNTO. So those are JNTO ads. So basically, our job, my job, is just to make everyone want to go to Japan. It's a pretty great job. <laughs> and yeah, I got it pretty easy, to be honest. Um, you know, who doesn't love Japan? Who doesn't want to go to Japan? No, that's definitely true. I think a lot of people uh, really love Japan. I love Japan. You love Japan. Exactly. Actually, so, and we want to, want to share that. Yeah, and one of the big things that JNTO specifically is really trying to do is promote not just Japan, but especially regional Japan. So I know that's something very dear to your heart. It's very dear to my heart. We want to get people to go not just to the amazing places like Tokyo and Kyoto and Mount Fuji. Like those are fantastic. I definitely think she, people should visit those places, but also check out places that people don't visit as much, like Shizuoka or Akita or Okinawa. And that's that's a big part of what we're trying to do as well. Yeah, no, that's fantastic to hear. Um, there's so many great places in Japan outside of the big cities that most people are familiar with. And it's awesome to hear that JNTO is promoting regional Japan as well. Exactly. Yeah. So what do you actually do at JNTO like you promote Japan but what do you do <laughs> <laughs> so there's a few different things um we are quite a small office there's only seven of us so we all do a little bit of everything but my primary role is looking after travel agents and tour operators so i um, trying to make sure that they are well educated and they have the resources they need and that's sorry i'm falling into my industry speak but basically making sure that travel agents and tour operators 
know Japan. And if they have questions about Japan for their clients, or if they want to make new tour products or advertise new areas of Japan or something, I try to help them find that information. So through that, I get to do, um, we call them road shows. So we do like seminars basically for travel agents. And I've had the great opportunity to travel to some various parts of Australia and New Zealand through that, which has been really exciting. Um, I also get to travel to Japan generally once a year. I've not gone this year for obvious reasons, but um, well, actually that's sort of true. I did go in February, but that was the last Japanese financial year. So anyway, uh, so yeah, I get to travel to Japan for work, which is really exciting. I, um, when I do that, that's when I, we take travel agents over there so they can experience Japan firsthand so that when they come back, they can then tell their clients you know, hey, I've actually been to Japan and yeah, like I can tell you firsthand, it's really easy to get around basically like what we do, but for them, it's a professional, like it's a study trip. So I go along to make sure that everything goes smoothly and also for my own education. So I've gotten to visit some new places through that. And then the other thing I do my sort of day to day aside from just answering questions from travel agents is um, helping with any of the other campaigns that we do. So sometimes we put out editorials, so I'll help with the fact checking on that, or um, we've got some social media. So you're all here on Instagram, please follow JNTO as well. We're Visit Japan AU. We post some beautiful content um, to inspire you for your next trip to Japan, whenever that may be. So yeah, that's in, I don't know, two paragraphs, my job. <laughs> <laughs> two paragraphs in a nutshell. Yeah. yeah, your job sounds awesome. I'm sure that a lot of people, like it involves travel. A lot of people at some point in their life have dreamed of having a job where they could travel and you're doing that. Absolutely. Like I have 100% landed my dream job. I I tell people this all the time and I'm not just, I'm honestly, I'm not just saying it because I'm here representing JNTO. Like if you ask any of my friends, I will tell them, like I have my dream job. I get to travel. I get to spend all day talking about Japan. <laughs> What's not to love about that? <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. I, um, I would talk about Japan almost all day too, but yeah, you yeah. get it. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, I honestly had no idea that um, you guys also handled New Zealand. Yep. We don't do as much in New Zealand. Um, and that's, you know, purely from a, frankly, from a budgetary perspective, like there aren't as many people in New Zealand, so we don't get as much budget. But um, we do some advertising campaigns there, we do get to get over there and um, do, like I said, those seminars. We've done also um, like consumer facing events. So those are things like here in Sydney, we've got that great Masuri in Sydney, JNTO as Visit Japan usually takes out a booth there. And our office will also take out booths in the festivals in um, New Zealand as well. So like Wellington and Auckland and Christchurch. Right, so that's another part of your job that you also do as part of JNTO is uh, some of the festivals in Mutt City that happen. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's funny, I was looking over, like earlier today, I was refreshing myself on the other Insta Lives that you've done, and I have been involved in some way with every single organization or person you've interviewed so far. So like, I have the great opportunity through Jet AA. So you interviewed obviously Ashley, our president. And through that, I've had the amazing opportunity to get to know the consulate general and work with them in that space. And then obviously through JNTO, we work with the consulate general as well. Um, and then I am a member of what I go into Sydney and you interviewed Kolji. And then you also interviewed um, Smash. And through JNTO, I've had the opportunity to actually work at a booth at Smash. So those of you who saw the banner for this, where I have the takoyaki um, head thing, I can't remember the English word for it, the kaburimono, um, that's from when I worked at Smash. So you've just like, combined everything that I do in <laughs> my lead-in, thanks. Okay, well, that was completely coincidental. Um... <laughs> 
But it does go to show you how linked we all are once you're a part of that sort of Japan family here in Australia and I guess New Zealand as well. Um, That's right. Absolutely. We are all linked. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So you, you're a part of Wodaiko Nindo Sydney as well. Yeah. Uh, did you, when did you first start playing Paiko? So I started in Japan. Um, the first time I saw Taiko was in university. So I'm from the States, as you may have picked up from the accent. Um, and in university, one of my friends was on the Taiko team at our school, and she had been doing it since high school. So I saw her play, and I thought, this is amazing, but there's no way I can do this because I have no natural musical talent or sense of rhythm. But then when I did Jet, uh, my assistant principal at the high school where I was teaching asked if I was interested in Taiko. And I said, well, I'm, yes, I'm, I'm interested in it. And he said, come, come practice. My friend has a team. You should come try it. And on the first night I went to the practice, the instructor said, all right, we practice on Mondays and Wednesdays for an hour and a half and you'll come every week. And I, uh, okay, yeah, sure. This is not going to go well, but why not? And gosh, it's nearly, in fact, it's over 10 years now that I've been doing it. So. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So you've, you've been a part of Taiko for a long time. I have, yeah. It's it's a part of me. I can't imagine living somewhere that doesn't have a Taiko team and not ha not getting to be a part of it. Well, maybe if you ever did live somewhere where there's no Taiko team, you'd have to create your own. I'm not sure I have the the skill to instruct, but uh, maybe maybe I can work to just find other like-minded people and find someone else in the community who can instruct, and may, maybe that could work. Maybe, maybe. But yeah, so <laughs> you said that you're from the states, which potentially not everyone is um, familiar with that because you're living and working in Australia. Yeah. So I, um, I joined. <laughs> uh, so I joined Jet from the States. I was born and raised in the U.S. Um, and I heard about, I'm going to go on a bit of a, a little storytelling spree here. So bear with me. Um, I will answer your question to get back around to this. But so I was born and raised in the States. And I, um, when I was in university, I did a study abroad in Kyoto. And while I was there, one of my uni friends who had graduated uh, the year, no, two years before me, um, did the JET program. And she was in Japan on JET while I was studying abroad. So she was like, hey, come hang out with me. Um, I'll you know, tell you about this thing I'm doing. So that's how I found out about it. And that's why I decided to apply. So then I did the JET program as a participant, participant from the States, and I was there for four years. Um, while I was there, I started dating my now husband, uh, who I had met online. That's a whole long story for another time, because that's not directly Japan related, except for this bit where we started dating while I lived in Japan. And he's from Sydney. So after a couple of years of dating, he proposed, and I moved over here. Ah, oh, that's so romantic. <laughs> it's it's a pretty cute, it's a long story, but I, I do feel that it's quite a cute story. But then I'm, you know, it's my story, so I'm a bit biased. I don't know. I feel like it's a pretty cute story. <laughs> and it just goes to show how global everything is now that you, you know, you grew up in the States and then you went to Japan and met the love of your life in Japan and now... You're here in Australia. Exactly. And it's also like, I want to use that as a little plug for, um, for Jet AA as well. Because like, as you said in the intro, I am the vice president of Jet AA New South Wales, who I've been involved with um, for, what, five, five years now. Um, but I'm not, I'm not from New South Wales, but I do live here. So that's why I am very much a part of the Jet AA New South Wales community. So for you know, anyone who might be watching if they're from Sydney, but they've decided to move somewhere else, you know, mm -hmm. seek out other like-minded organizations. If you were a JET participant or if you're thinking of JET, but you don't know if you'll have friends after, JET is an awesome way to connect with other people who are passionate about Japan. Yeah, so that's awesome advice. Um, I'm just going to jump in. I'm not the only one who thinks that your story is cute. I can see that we've got a few comments 
of other people saying that it's romantic or giving or yay thank you <laughs> <laughs> just so you know um but yeah so you you moved to australia how did you first start working at jnto how did you land your dream job i got incredibly lucky because i was not actually looking for work when this position came up um, i was contacted by a recruiter who had been um, appointed by jnto who found my profile on seek seek or indeed i think it was seek um, so i had a profile up there because i had been looking for work prior and i just still had it up there i had that i did jet that i spoke japanese that i had level n2 japanese um, that I studied uh, Asian studies in uni and she looked at that and said, you'd be perfect, would you like to apply? And initially I actually said no, because I wasn't looking for another job and because where I was working at the time, it was coming into their busiest season. So I didn't wanna leave them put out, but I spoke to my supervisor and I said, look, here was this, like, I got approached for this. I don't know, do you think I should try? And she said, look, give it a try. This, this sounds like something up your alley. You might not even get it. And then you get to stay with us and we get to keep you. But if you do get it, then that's something you consider then. So I was really lucky to have an awesome supervisor who could support me that way. So I decided to give it a try. And when they interviewed me, after the interview, I was like, I have to have this job. Like I, I, I'm going to feel so bad for leaving my current job. But my manager has given me her blessing. And like, I have to have this. So I like researched the, you know, what, what should you do to follow up on an interview? And so I sent a letter to the directors at JNTO through the recruiter because she said that's, you know, because you came through me, the letter should come through me. But then I also found um, the interview was also with some of the local staff in the office. So I found them on LinkedIn or maybe it was Facebook at the time. Um, because they were also Jet AA members, we had like mutual friends, and I sent them a message just to say, look, that was, I really appreciate the opportunity to interview, I'm really excited about this. And luckily they picked me. So I, for people who are looking for a, a job, looking for a career, just open for opportunities, I cannot speak highly enough about making sure that if you are looking for work, that you have an active profile on sites like Seek and Indeed, and that you um, that you do reach out to recruiters as well. You know, like you won't always find the job you want through a recruiter, but it's in their interest to give you a good job as well. Like if they place a good candidate for that company, that company's going to trust them. So I think you know, trying lots of different channels if you are looking for a job is a great way to do it and if you have done jet or if you've studied abroad in japan and you want to work in some capacity with japan definitely make sure you include that on you know any of your your resume or your profile but even if you did that and you don't want to work in japan related stuff a lot of those skills are super transferable and i know that's something ashley spoke about as well but like Working at JNTO now, my only background that qualifies me for JNTO is that I speak Japanese, I lived and worked in Japan, so I know what it's like to work for a Japanese organization, and I've done a lot of travel. And that's it. But that, that doesn't really directly relate to my day-to-day. -day. I, don't, I don't have any background in marketing. I don't have any background in the travel industry. But because I'm passionate about Japan and because I, as a teacher, I did public speaking and a big part of my role is giving presentations and doing trainings and teaching. Um, they saw that those skills would be really useful for what I do. And I definitely think that they have been useful. Like Jet was a huge jumping stone for me to be able to do this. Yeah. No, that's, that's fantastic to hear. And you've got a lot of good advice wrapped up in that for um i guess for people who are currently looking for work or for jets who might be watching um who might have just recently returned or for people who are wanting to maybe get involved in japan related organizations such as jnto um yeah that's really awesome advice uh i did want to ask so you said that um you speak japanese you have an n2 yep. level do you 
feel like that's necessary for everybody who is looking for a Japan related job? Not everybody. I think it depends on what kind of organization you want to work for and what kind of role you want to be in. So, for instance, I know that JNTO offices around the world,、um, many of the local staff do speak Japanese, but it's not a requirement in all of them. For the Sydney office, it is a requirement, and there's a whole slew of reasons for that, but basically, it depends on the office and where they are.、Um, For other Japanese organizations, such as you know, the Consulate General or Japan Foundation or Claire, things like that, I can't、um, speak to those as I've not worked for those organizations. But I would imagine it probably depends on how big the organization is, how much you have to do with Japanese speaking、uh, superiors and stakeholders. So, like, my day to day in the office is about 50 50 Japanese and English because half of our staff. Um, you know, three out of seven of our staff are Japanese. So while they do speak English,、um, we do speak a lot of Japanese. I also liaise with our head office in Japan, with our partners in Japan, things like、um, hotels and、uh, theme parks and things like that. So I, I've got to be able to communicate with them. If people want to get into Japan related stuff but are maybe a bit more open, things like, you know, working in the travel industry or maybe in Um, Japanese culture related things, like you don't necessarily have to speak Japanese. I, I don't think that's the case at all. I know plenty of people who are very passionate about Japan、um, and who are great proponents of Japan who don't speak Japanese, who work in Japan related jobs. They, frankly speaking, would not be able to work at JNTO Sydney because of that, but they might be able to work at, for instance, I don't know, JNTO. Rome or something, you know, like I, who knows? It, it, just, it just depends. Yeah, no, I'm sure that's good news for some people who are really passionate about Japan and want to be involved in Japan in some way, you know, as their dream job, but are maybe a little bit worried that their Japanese skills are not going to allow them to do that. Uh, yeah, I、okay. don't think that's the case. I think,、um, you know, I think if you are positive that you want to work in something that does have to do with Japan, I think some Japanese study would certainly go a long way, if nothing else, to show that future employer just how interested and how dedicated you are. But the level of Japanese required for a given job will very much depend on what the expectations are for you in that role. Like, for example, It's entirely feasible that at some point in the future,、um, or some point in the past for that matter, that in our office, as like a local staff whose main role might be to work with consumers and answer all the questions from Australians who want to know about you know, advice for their travel to Japan, if really you know, 90 to 100% of their day to day is working with English speakers, it's feasible that they might not need any Japanese language. In our case, it doesn't work that way because of how many you know, broad things we do, but I think there's definitely possibilities for that. But I do think、yeah. that being bilingual or at least having some level of another language、um, is going to be increasingly important going forward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with that.、Um, did you get your N2 in Japan? I did, yeah. So I started studying Japanese in uni, which surprises a lot of people because I'm half Japanese and my mom was born and raised in Japan.、Um, so I'm fully half Japanese, half American, Caucasian American, and、uh, I grew up not speaking Japanese. Apparently, I was actually talking to my aunts about this last year.、Um, apparently, when I was little, I did speak a little bit, like, Just picked it up while I was there, but、um, I forgot all of it by the time I was in like junior high or high school. So, yeah, come high school, I thought I wanted to try learning. I talked to my mom into sending me to a Japanese Saturday school, and I quit after three weeks because I was the only 16 year old in the class full of five year olds, and I just couldn't take it. But uni was the perfect place to start because I could start with other people my age who were at the same level as me. 
And, you know, some of them might be a little bit more advanced because, like, they had binged all of the anime they could get and they knew, like, some phrases from that. And others were like me, you know, who maybe had a little bit of Japanese background, knew some phrases, and others who knew nothing. So, yeah, so I started in uni. I studied Japanese for all four years of my university degree. Then I did Czech for four years. And while I was there, I continued studying. And I took N1 and I didn't pass. And I thought, you know what? I'm probably not going to use that kind of technical Japanese. I think N2 is generally good enough. And I just, but I didn't stop studying. I just stopped book study, <laughs> you know, like I was still using <laughs> Japanese in my everyday. For the N1. Yeah, yeah I'm, exactly. I'm in the exact same boat as you. Um, another person who is watching us uh, has said same, so they resonate with your story there, starting <laughs> their studies later later in life. Um, I feel that as well, having started in university and then continuing on JET continuing to study. I grabbed my N2 uh, while I was in Japan as well. Uh, tried for the N1 and unfortunately failed, but you know, maybe one day. Maybe. Maybe one day. <laughs> but yeah, so can you tell me a little bit more about your, um, your time on JET, like specifically? Yeah, so I did JET from 2009 to 2013, so I was there for four years. And I was an ALT, so an lang um, assistant language teacher, an English teacher, in Shizuoka Prefecture in a little town called Kanaya. And I find that with Japanese people, 80 to 90% of them don't know Kanaya, but the last 10 to 20 do because it's a station on the old Tokaido that connected Tokyo to Kyoto. Oh. And it's got one of the oldest um, SL, steam locomotives, in Japan. That's quite a hot spot for you know, the train lovers. So there are some people who do know it, but aside from that, most people don't. Um, I loved it there. So I was a high school teacher, which was perfect because I do not think of myself as good with little kids. All the friends tell me I am, but I just, yeah. I, more of a more of a big kid person thank you um and my students were not good at english but they were really really sweet and lovely and for the most part they loved me which was nice and the ones who didn't at the very least they just didn't really seem to like much of anything so <laughs> it wasn't just me and you know not everybody has to like you that's okay um but my school was also really small, which was nice. So that I, every year, so I had two classes a day, sorry, two classes a week with each of the first year students, which is the equivalent of year 10. And so by, after about a month and a half, I knew the name of every kid in my first year class, which there were 120 of them. So I did well with that. And then the next year I got my new group and then the next year I got my new group. So by midway through my third year, I knew the name of every single kid in the school. Well, you're doing a lot better than me. I'm terrible <laughs> with names and I can hardly remember probably 10, 15. <laughs> and I'm still in touch with, with some of them, which I really love. Um, so I am gonna give you some pictures if you don't mind putting some more up. I know you did a post of some of my travels through Japan through JNTO this week, but um, I've got some more that I want to share because I've done so much travel in Japan and I want to push that jet connection a little bit more. So yeah. I've got some pictures of some of my old students who I still see when I go back to Japan and I still talk to one of them the other night. So like when you spoke to Ashley uh, a few weeks ago, she mentioned that we do the um, hump day with Jedi, the Wednesday night drinks. And yeah. at the time we were doing that every week on Zoom and now we're doing it fortnightly. And one of my old students actually joined this week. Like he came on and he chatted with us and he struggled a bit, but he had a really good time and he was able to follow most of it. And like, not only is that so like heartwarming for me as an ex teacher that like I still have this connection with him, but also that he has worked to maintain his English to that level. Like that, that is something that like, I, I don't want to be a teacher, but that sense of accomplishment, I can understand why people do want to be a teacher and like why it's so important to have good teachers that can inspire you that way. So I like to think that I was one of those. I think you definitely were. If your students, 
is the living proof. <laughs> but yeah, oh my goodness, that's also such a heartwarming story. I feel like your conversation has been filled with them. <laughs> but yeah. um, so I know that we are running a little bit close to time. However, do you have a little bit of time to talk with me about some of your travels? Absolutely. Like, Absolutely. <laughs> that's like asking the little kid, would you like some ice cream? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. There, there's no way I was going to say no to that. <laughs> okay. Well, in that case, uh, where have you been? Or is that too many to name by this point? In it, Japan? Is, it is too many to name. Okay. Yeah. How about we rein this in? Um, what about your top five? Oh, okay. Five. I need us a top five. Yeah, I like that. Um, so obviously Shizuoka is way up there um, <clears throat> because not only did I live there, but it's a beautiful place. It's great because it shows a sort. It's like it's a slower side of Japan. You know, it's just a bit more chill. And it's got everything. It's got mountains, it's got tea fields, it's got rivers, it's got ocean. You can go surfing in Shizuoka, you can go hiking in Shizuoka. There's a place where you can do archery in a volcanic crater. Uh, there's a theme park with roller coasters. There's unagi and mikan and green tea and wasabi. And like, I could talk about Shizuoka for forever. Also, the Mount Fuji. So that's gonna be way up there. Um, this is a bit of a stereotype and it's one of those things that everyone says, but Kyoto. And that's not just because it's a beautiful city, but I feel like on my study abroad, I went to Doshisha University in Kyoto and living in Kyoto and getting to explore um, the quieter sides of the city and not just the key tourist sites, which are great but now we're you know getting increasingly crowded but getting to explore those quieter bits i really enjoyed and that's obviously something you can do in so many different parts of japan but just having lived there that's one thing um i am not going to say osaka as much as i want to because that's where my family is from but the JNTO side of me is pushing me to, to pick more regional areas. And Kyoto's already been ticked off. So I've got Kyoto and Shizuoka. Kanazawa. Okay, well, I'll start with the sneaky six. Okay, deal. Kanazawa, which is, you know, getting more and more well known, but is still, it's, it's still kind of like a quieter alternative to Kyoto. Um, it's got a lot of that Kyoto feel, but it's smaller, it's quieter. There's a castle, there's a Japanese garden, there's gold leaf crafts, there's uh, the tea house district, um, there's a ninja temple. It's amazing. Yeah, that sounds like it's got everything you want to say. Yeah, that's three. Uh, number four will be Okinawa. And I, I have trouble narrowing it down because I've only actually been to two parts of Okinawa. So I've been to Okinawa main island, like Naha and um, surrounds. And then I've mm -hmm. been to Ishigaki and Iriomote. And I loved Ishigaki and Iriomote for the quietness of them. Um, you know, they're really, for people who want to do like the swimming and the hiking and the just chilling out, like not, you know, going to a different sightseeing spot every day, that's awesome. But if you want the quiet bit of holiday after that, I would say, like, Ishigaki, Iriomote, yeah. for sure. Yeah, so that's like the stereotypical vacation where you would picture yourself chilling on beaches and... Yeah, drinking. but then, like, also know. with that, with a lot of that, like, traditional Ryukyu and culture, you know, the traditional Okinawan culture, which is quite different to the mainland Japanese culture. It is, it is. I actually did my um, study abroad in Okinawa, so... Nice! That's awesome! Yeah. Right, number five. So I see someone watching has suggested Kagoshima, and I do like Kagoshima, but... I feel like this requires a drum roll. Oh, this one's a really Not hard one. On. Like the, last, 
the last one in my top five. There's a lot of pressure on this. Well, we've already got number six, Osaka, so we just need to fill in the gap. Mm. Okay. Oh, no, not that one. Like, I like that one, but it's not a... See, I was expecting you to ask me top three, and then you said five, and now you've thrown me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I just know that you had a lot of places that I felt like top three would, yeah, you know, restrict that too much. Yeah. Okay, how about we move on? And if you think okay. of a fifth in the meantime, you can... Good plan. Sort of <laughs> I've got my number five. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, then which is your favorite season? What do you recommend that people visit Japan in? Is that That's even possible? That's not an easier question. <laughs> you picked me. Uh, I, I am 50-50 between summer and autumn. Oh, and summer. part of that Part of that is because the contrarian in me does not want to pick spring because everyone says spring. Um, and I, I don't like being cold, so winter's obviously not it. Uh, the issue is the humidity. I don't like humidity, but somehow in Japan it is kind of tolerable. And especially if you go to places like Hokkaido where you know it's not as humid or to Okinawa where like you're by the ocean it's going to be humid anyway so plus like all the summer festivals and like the street food yeah. like I, I can't go past that but autumn yeah. is great because it's just a little bit more comfortable plus like the autumn leaves are gorgeous okay you know what number five is um Nagoya surrounds and I know this is an interesting one because a lot of people and I've heard Japanese people as well say Nagoya doesn't have much and I disagree. I think Nagoya is lovely. Like, and here I'm kind of meaning like using Nagoya as sort of Aichi in general, but like, I love castles. So Nagoya Castle is great to me. Um, the, the shrine that suddenly the name has flown out of my head. I want to say Atsuta Shrine, but I'm not 100% positive on that. Um, Nagi in Nagoya is great. Uh, the the gorge Koranke, I think it's called Koranke Gorge, where the autumn leaves. I saw the autumn leaves last year. Absolutely, like blow your mind, stunning. So, yeah, oh, I'll have, have to visit there. Then. <laughs> All right, you've. I've got my. I've got my next destination when I'm able to travel in autumn. I'm gonna go there. Perfect. On Sally's recommendation. Yeah. Also in Aichi for the anime lovers. The um, Expo Park, like the World Expo Park, has the Totoro House, Satsuki and Mei's house. And you can go and take a tour and you can go inside the house. And they've like done it so that you can like open up all the drawers and see things. Like, really? They've got like the brand of like meeting that is true to the time of the show and like clothes that are suitable for the age of the children. And you can take a picture on the porch wearing like Satsuki and Mei's like little hats with their little bag. Yeah, I believe you shared that photo with me. I, I've, I've shared that one. So anyone who's yeah. watching, if you haven't seen the post yet, you can pop back one um, and see Sally's little slideshow of her adventures. Um, I believe I put that as number two. Sounds about right. In your slideshow. I, I could be lying. I apologize, <laughs> everyone, if it's number three, but it's towards the front. It was such a cute picture. But yes. Anyway, I think I'm going to have to start wrapping it up. Is there anything that you would like to say at the very end? Uh, again, like I cannot speak highly enough about for careers, like having your profile out there, reaching out to recruiters and to companies directly. Um, you know, if you're interested in Japan, study some Japanese, even if not for career wise, just because I think it really helps you appreciate the culture of it more as well. Like learning the language goes into it a lot. Um, a plug for Jede in New South Wales, you know, even if you're not a current or ex jet, we like if you're interested in Japan, we want to get to know you. And last but certainly not least, JNTO's uh, social media, visit Japan AU. 
We, our account is Visit Japan AU. Our hashtag is Visit Japan AU. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. We've got lots of pretty pictures and exciting videos to make you wish you were in Japan. Or if you are in Japan, give you lots of ideas for where else to go. Wonderful. All right. Thank you so much, Sally, for joining me. It's been awesome chatting to you about everything. <laughs> I, th Thank I think you, Jess. Yeah, this has been great. great. <laughs> But yeah, all right, I'm gonna say goodbye, let you go. Thank you so much. Enjoy Thanks, the rest of your Friday. Thanks, everyone. Uh, all right, I hope that you guys all enjoyed that talk as much as I did, and maybe you even have a new wish list destination to go to. I know I do. Hopefully, you do too when we are able to travel. Anyway. Thank you all for joining. Thank you for watching. Uh, thank you for all of your uh, engagement with us. I love all of your emojis here. And, yes, so just big thank you. And don't forget to tune into our next episode, which will be on September 25th. So look forward to that one. We've got something very excited, exciting. I'm excited. We've got something very special planned. All right. Goodbye, guys. Have a lovely weekend. See you later.